Hey all, welcome to the Military Wire with Mike Schindler. This is the podcast where we interview America's most elite men and women who have served this country. As you know, we share the stories of overcoming their proven lessons in leadership and their journey to finding mission and purpose. And today's topic is how to leverage your past to shape your future. This is so important for so many who are transitioning is really how do you take that past experience leverage it so it can help shape your future. And I know many of you uh, likely know people who have allowed their circumstances or past or childhood experiences to define them, to define their today and their future. And they kind of get trapped in this victim of bad past and when they have the potential to really do so much to add value to the day. And I, I will tell you that our guest, I'm excited about our guest, is retired Lieutenant Colonel Bill Riley, author of the book, Baghdadi, How Saddam Hussein Taught Me to Be a Better Father. That's right, Saddam Hussein, how he taught me to be a better father. He's going to be unpacking this topic for us. And before I properly introduce Lieutenant Colonel Bill Riley, I want to put a shout out to this segment sponsors, Honest Talk International and Circle for Parents. Both these organizations have a vetted network of experts who are standing by to help all of you navigate issues related to nutrition, fitness, parenting, relationships, intimacy. I encourage you guys to visit their sites, honesttalkinternational.com and circleforparents.com. Bill, welcome to the show. Hi, Mike. It's uh, really great to be here. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm excited to have you on the show. I, intriguing book title. When I got your book, Baghdadi, How Saddam Hussein Taught Me to Be a Better Father, uh, I, I was like, what, what is this all about? Um, and as I started digging in, it kind of reveals uh, your childhood experiences and, and along with your time in the Middle East and how that is has and continues to shape your life. Talk to us about your childhood and how you broke out of the trouble past to eventually go on to lead really the Air Force's largest network operations of, in the security center. And eventually you were awarded the, the Air Force uh, Combat Action Medal. So, but you had a troubled past. So walk us through that. That's true. The, um, uh, this is, this is in a lot of ways a cause and effect story. It's, um, it, in the early part, there were overcoming some events and that led us, or that led me to, um, after the events happened, after my father passed away, after some lessons were taught, uh, it, it it, it let me look back and it let me see what in the early years led to some challenges and then some successes in the later years as those, those, those lessons actually um, were passed along and, 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 and activated. So, I, you know, I'd like to start by saying that, you know, Baghdad is a war story that started when I was about five years old. Uh, my mother was a schizophrenic and when we were young, she was um, beautiful and charming and, she created this magical world for us, but uh, schizophrenia is an insidious disease. And as she struggled to reconcile the world she'd created with the realities of her life, her, her pendulum would swing wide and she grew violent and abusive. And you have to keep in mind, this was back in the, the 70s. Um, mental illness was, there were still, there, there were a lot of great discoveries. There were a lot of things that were going on that were exciting, but mental illness was still a stigma. It was um, not something you talked about and definitely not something that families let out in the open. So there was always this tension that simmered around her. And when it would boil over, I was her target. Uh, fortune. Oh, so fortunately I had, um, I had a younger sister who could, she, <laughs> She was better at navigating um, our mother's moods. And um, at the time, uh, Isabel was um, my first medic. She could stop my bleeding with random things from the freezer. And she tended my wounds until I was able to, to stand up for myself. My father, on the other hand, he was a burned hand, teaches best kind of Marine. And uh, he really wanted the best life for us, but he was always gone. Um, working many jobs or at school. And, and there was a lot he didn't see. And what he did see, he figured would toughen me up. Um, he saw terrible combat in Vietnam. He didn't come back the same as when he left. And he, um, he didn't get the warm welcome I did from people when he returned. Uh, people were cruel to, oh yeah, you know, because some um, people were cruel to our Vietnam vets. 
they came home and most of them didn't get the care and support they deserved. Uh, now, today we recognize that PTS or PTSD is a consequence of combat. Um, but my father dealt with it by living a life to this harsh code and to standards that as a child, I could, I could rarely meet. So growing up like that, I learned some hard lessons and I, they, they, they've actually served me well. And, um, the first thing, especially for vets coming back from, from, uh, some of the places where we send them, um, you know, if there's a reconstitution period, then sometimes depending on what you've seen and done, uh, that can be dark. So the first thing I learned is that regardless how dark and bad it gets, I keep moving forward because uh, you can get through the bad times to the goodness. It's out, it's out there waiting for you. You just have to. Yeah, I, I want to unpack that a little bit, Bill. And, uh, you know, your childhood, when you describe that, you, you, your mom, you know, being beautiful, but then having, you know, this dual or the schizophrenic personality, your dad coming back having to deal with trauma of war, you as a young child leaning on your sister, how, you know, and, and I know it might be difficult to kind of unpack that whole childhood experience a little bit, but what was, I mean, it's turbulent, right? It's a challenging, you know, childhood that's, that, that's leading you into adulthood. Mm -hmm. What, what type of coping, obviously you developed these coping skills that served you well in the military, but as you were going through that youthful period, you, you said something that really hit me, that Baghdadi really was a journey for you that started when you were five. So did you, it's a mindset, right? We talk about like 80% of everything that we do is psychological. So when you pushed that as a child, did you say, man, my life's just going to be messed up? Or did you kind of gear up and say, you know what, I've got to figure out how to change this and, and, and move beyond it. Obviously, that probably develop in your teenage years, but... Was there anything revealing through that experience that you just said, I, I can't continue down this path? There, there were, um, you, you go through when you live in an environment like this, um, you know, uh, you go through cycles. I, there are, and especially with a mother who was, um, you know, schizophrenic, it's, uh, there, there were good days, there were bad days, but, um, over time, the good days became fewer and fewer. The bad days became uh, worse and worse. So to cope with that, to deal with that is the first thing from a little kid's perspective, um, in, in, in terms of my family, because my mother told these rich stories was figuring out the, where the lies ended and where reality really began. And when you're a little kid, that's, that's kind of a tough thing because, uh, your, your parents, they're, they're, they're huge. They're the gods of your life. They, um, they provide, they, um, uh, most of the information is filtered through them. So uh, that first thing, the first difficult thing was really trying to figure out what families were like um, that were different from ours and, and doing a lot of the sampling, a lot of um, modeling on, um, I knew how things were at home, but um, really spending some time, not formally thinking about it when I was young, but now I know I... I would go into other people's homes. I would see how they did things. And, you know, at first I was quiet. I, I, I want to see what was going on, how, how their families work. It's sort of like when you go to a fancy dinner and they lay out all the silverware. And if, if you're not hundred percent sure what to do, you just pause for a second and you wait to see um, who moves first. And, and, and mm-hmm. And it, it, it's hard. So, but over time you start to, you start to develop it. I started to develop a sense for where her delusions were and that, that, that pertain to our family and where, um, what would be considered more normal or, 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 or more regular. And, um, so that was the first thing is, is awareness, trying to figure that out. One thing I found when I was in Baghdad, um, my, my first tour in Baghdad was, was kind of tough in that the first major mission that I went on, we were, we, we were downtown. I had the driver. We were trying to find a, um, we were trying to find the fire station and, uh, you know, we in America, we, we know, you know, first responders, you know, they're there, uh, um, there are phones, you know, you can, you can get something. And then back down in, in Baghdad, there were, 
not only, I think there were two functional fire stations at the time and the, the coalition government wanted to find more. So they, they would periodically, you know, cut out these missions and we go look for them and see if there was any left, see if there was any equipment we could use and then report it up and, and, and see if we could put it back in the inventory. And we had a bad event happen. Um, it, it, it was, it wound up being one of those traumatic things where it was a happy day. Um, the, the terrorist attacks had slowed down, had stopped. Uh, people were out in the streets. There was a market, a uh, big souk and, um, you know, uh, people would be in people again. And, and when you get more of that, that means that you're, you're, you're kind of winning. And, um, you know, uh, fire broke out in the, uh, gunfire broke out in the middle of the market and started cutting people down. And, um, we got pinned down by a bunch of children that just came rushing out of the alleys, like in the human wave. And it, it tied my Humvee to the spot and they put themselves in every single open crevice that could possibly exist in that. So we couldn't go forward. We couldn't go back. We couldn't make the move. And we were being pinned to that spot, um, probably because something bad was happening and then stuff started exploding. So where we had been pinned down before was a huge explosion. And while we were trying to pry these kids off the vehicle, there was a guy in an alley that was dialing um, numbers into a phone. And just because we were in a call dead spot or because his IED didn't work, um, the one that was across a hill from us went off, well, basically a pile of rubble. The one where we were didn't. And um, after we figured out what he was doing and we were able to um, pursue him, then when he ran away, the kids scattered, we were able to get out of there. But in terms of coping from the past, one of the things I found is, you know, people won't follow you if you react and you fall apart. So uh, there's a kind of a trust thing. People have to believe that if you're going to bring them into harm's way, that you have the skills and, and, and the ability and the calm to um, um, bring them back out safely uh, to the best of your ability. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. I, I love that point. And I, I, I've got to believe that you're your childhood helped shape that. How, how did, was it your father's influence that really drove you into the military? What, or was it this desire to be part of something bigger, a combination of both? How, how did you pick the military? Because oftentimes, you know, we know that folks that have troubled paths, they pick different paths. And yet you chose to continue to serve. Uh, how did you make that decision? It, it was a combination of a couple of things. You know, like most people, it's 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 complicated. I I I was fairly typical in in, in terms of I went into the military because um, I wanted other options than what I had right in front of me. Um, I I'd, I'd done some um, some sports in high school. I swam. I was in I threw discus and shot, but I was in pretty good shape. I passed the tests. But the the main thing for me was. Um, I needed to get out from where I was and, 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 and there's a, I had a rough event that happened. Um, I had reached the point where I was finally old enough in high school where I, I, I felt like I was finally starting to figure things out. You know, I, I, I was finally starting to figure out how to, uh, work around, um, my mother's anger. And, um, I, I was big enough where I could, I could try something. I remember very clearly the, the first time I, I, I put that into effect, I, I was, I, I was, it was still two, three weeks before uh, finals. I was prepping for them. I got into an argument with my mother in the kitchen and she picked up a hot frying pan and she came at me with it like it was a cleaver. And I just stopped her. I mean, I, I realized that I was bigger, I was stronger, and I was just able to stop her from swinging it, take it out of her hand, put her down. And I told her, I, 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 I said, after getting through a lot of anger and not wanting to, to, to react violently like she did, I just said, you know, we got to do something else. I said, I'm a man now. You're not going to hurt me or you're not going to hurt my sisters anymore. And for me, that was a, a milestone. I said, okay, I finally did an adult thing. I finally controlled myself. I finally stepped into a bigger world. So that night I fell asleep prepping for my high school finals. I, I was happy. I woke up um, with her on top of me, beating me with a heavy object, and I, I thought I was dead. Something was wrong. I couldn't move. And the last thing she told me before I passed out was, 
do you feel like a man now? So, and now eventually I woke up and that's a good thing. So there's goodness in the story. Uh, my sister Isabel cried that she tried to patch me up and um, I had a lot of bone bruises, a really bad concussion, a few cracked ribs. Uh, eventually my father um, came back around because my parents were divorced at that point and um, got me patched up a little bit. So it could have been worse. It was horrible, but it broke me. Um, and not physically, but it was the first time in my life I ever gave up. I, for some reason, I couldn't get this single thought out of my head while I, I, I was you know, hiding under my covers and healing myself and, and just saying, I'm done with it. I'm done with the world and I'm not going to do this. And it was something my father had told me. And he said, you know, one definition of adult is surviving your childhood. And mm. I'd never, re I'd never really paid much attention to it. You know, you carry around these things that your parents tell you. And then, you know, sometime down the road, uh, when you're an adult and you have children of your own, you open your mouth and their words come out. And that's kind of, right. I, you know, yeah. you, you have kids. Yo, absolutely. I've got two daughters and boys, sometimes they look at me and say, you sound a lot like grandpa. Yes, I totally, <laughs> get, it. I totally get it. And that's how we learn. That's how messages get passed along. Uh, that's right. A lot of times we hear these things and we're not prepared to, to act on them until circumstances change and something was there. So um, a few weeks later, it's finals. Um, the swelling's down. I could get around a little bit. My alarm goes off. I need to go to school, but I stayed in bed. Um, and I was perfectly prepared to just bail then because I, I really, uh, psychologically, that was there was a lot of bad things that happened, but that absolutely broke me. I, I, I gave up. I, I lost faith. And I hear these noises. Um, and the only reason I graduated from high school was because friends who were worried about me actually were able to finally get into my house. And um, they dumped ice water on me when I told them to go screw themselves because I wasn't getting out of there. And then they dragged me out of bed. And these are girls, well, young, young women. Um, and they started throwing stuff at me and throwing clothes at me and dragging me into the car. And they took me to the finals. And I was sullen and, and, and angry and sore. And, um, and the only reason I didn't bail was because at that moment, I was so stunned that anyone would care. And that, that was the second great lesson of my childhood is I didn't always have to make it on my own. Mm. I had real friends good. and I was stronger and better with them. Yeah, that's so good, Bill. I love, I mean, you're describing the military, right? This sense of, you know, obviously the military gives us all that sense of mission and purpose, but that support network that you talk about, you know, battle buddies, shipmates, et cetera, that come around you and challenge us to be who they see we, you know, who we see, who they see us to be, right? And I mean, you're describing that. And what I love about your story, I mean, troubled past, no question, dealing with your mom, which you're supposed to lean into a mom's love. And, and that's a traumatic issue. You, you join the military, you go on to, you know, be awarded the Air Force Combat Action Medal. Um, I, I love the story of you being dyslexic and learning to read, how that was difficult. And yet here you are today, an author, a multiple author of multiple books, actually your first book being Asher's Tears. Uh, but this book, Baghdadi, I, I and it's so revealing now when you describe how you started really this started living this story at the age of five. But on the cover, you've got a boy pointing a gun essentially at the reader, which I found pretty interesting um, because the premise of the book suggests that, you know, I, the reader, can learn how to be a better father through through Saddam, which is terrifying to me in to some degree. So <laughs> I, I really want to give you the opportunity to explain that. So um, what what will people get from your book? I mean, what is the like, because that's a pretty big, bold statement. Like you became a better father because of Saddam. So unpack that. And I, I encourage every one of our listeners to get your book because it's compelling. It's really, really good. But unpack that for me. All right. Thanks. Like, let's, yes, <laughs> it, 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 it's absolutely terrifying. The thought of Saddam Hussein teaching parenting skills, because uh, the two examples we have that, that he did, he didn't do so great. But uh, how often do we really get to see the best example of anything? Sometimes, sometimes we do, and we, we relish those moments. I, there, and this is another military tie is, and I think this is unique to the 
the brotherhood of men and women that that serve, that protect each other, that are there for each other. There are, are and, and in the intelligence service too, because I, 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 I've got ties to that community because of how I, I, I came into the service. But there are men and women I've met that if they asked me for anything, I would do it. I wouldn't hesitate because it was them. I would give them whatever they asked for. Um, I would do whatever they said they needed because they were the best example and they earned that degree of love and respect. But more often than not, we learn from the people that teach us what not to do. Yeah, great and point. Great point. So, and Saddam is a great example of that. And it, uh, and it also didn't help that I was trying to figure out what kind of man I would be. I, I, was at, I was at that crossroads in my life and what kind of family I wanted and what kind of father I, I, I might be when right in the middle when I was always deployed in and around Iraq because um, Saddam Hussein could not honor the terms of his surrender after the Gulf War. So we were always there. And those deployments gave me some amazing and uh, quite honestly, terrifying experiences. But in between the, the wow and the, oh my God, there was time to think about things. And um, at, in that time, it, it, it helped me put what was truly important to me into perspective for my life. But you're, you're, you're right, Mike. The, uh, the Baghdadi cover is polarizing. Yeah. And, uh, and, 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 and I love it. Um, in, because I, I, I really do. The, well, funny story. The, um, the artist that, that designed that, you know, when I first, we went through and they delivered the first cover and I said, I get where you're going with that, but that's not what the story is about. And she said, well, why? And I said, you need to read two more chapters in the book and, and, and you'll get it. And, uh, about a week later, she, after she, she called me up and she's like, oh my God, okay, now I know what you're talking about. And she asked me to send her, uh, I don't have a lot of pictures from my childhood, but I fortunately have an uncle who, who kept everything and archived it. And he sent me um, some pictures, some pretty cool pictures of when I was, I was little about that five, six, seven, eight age. And she, she went through all the stock photography and she found a, a kid that, that looked remarkably like I did when I was little. And that's what was the basis for, for that, you know, a, a, a child warrior. Um, you know, I, I wish we lived in the world where there weren't child soldiers, but we, we do. And, and they're a part of this story. So, um, I wanted someone to be able to see it across the room and, and, and know that it was a little different and that I think in the art that there's something there that also captures some of the warlike aspects of my upbringing. And, and it focuses on that one line, um, of, you know, why do adults use kids like that? Because in, a lot of cultures that cuts across that part of my upbringing when I was in Iraq, uh, when I saw um, the the POWs in Kuwait when when I was there when we were doing the the rebuilding after it was the 13th province of of Iraq, and I had the opportunity to be at a um, POW MIA day uh, from the Kuwaiti side, and it had been six, seven, seven years since the, um, the war with Iraq ended when we, when I was at the end of my tour there and they had the lines of POWs that had been, um, turned out of hospitals or captured and sent to, uh, Iraq, um, from Kuwait. And the thing that struck me about it was at the time they were almost all tweens and young teenagers, which meant that they were between 12 and 14 years old when they were loaded up into rail cars and, and, and brought to Iraq before they were repatriated. So as it, sad as that is, that's the reality of the world that we live in. And that's a message that we, we, we just really can't forget because that's, that's out there. And that's one of the things we do in the military is we help protect people who can't protect themselves. Yeah, I see. I love that. But I think... And it's so true. I mean, we are on the front lines, truly the front lines of, of helping keep the world safe. And, and it, it's so defining for me when you describe what you saw, like other, you know, teens and tweens and in and, and the life that they're kind of forced into. And in many ways, you live that differently, a little differently, but in many ways shared some of those same shared experiences of, of having to combat your childhood 
but how you moved beyond it, moved through it and gained you know, lessons from it that evaded you to become, uh, in my mind, pretty doggone successful. And and now your wife, your, your wife serves in the military. Is she still active duty in the military right now? She is not. She retired about four years ago. And, is that uh, right? And now she's a special ed teacher. Oh, man. See, I, I, I love, I mean, both of you have, have, have continued to give back. Your book gives back so much. And I, I, what I love about your story, Bill, is that you continue to give, you share your experiences. Your mess has really become part of your message, which I love. <laughs> I love that. I mean, it, it, it really has. And I think it's so important that people pick up your book. I, you know, when you transition, there's, you know, people go through different trials, experiences, et cetera. If there, if there was one bit of advice you had for a transitioning service member, what would it be? Well, I'd say first, make sure you've thought through the reasons why you're transitioning. Uh, your, your circumstances and goals are yours and only you can say what's right. But I can't even count the number of times I've run into someone who wished they would have stayed in or stayed in a little bit longer. And um, so if, if it's your plan to leave, just make sure that you've, you've thought it through, you've covered the bases. If you haven't earned a retirement yet, um, uh, look into the reserves because there's a way that you can, you can still top off and, and get to your, uh, a retirement depending on where you, you exit the service and, um, still maintain the hand in it while you transition into the civilian world. It's not for everyone, but it's a good avenue that's out there for, for, for a lot of people to help them, um, kind of have the best of both worlds. So if you're committed to leaving, I wish you all the best, but, uh, have a plan. Yeah, no question. I mean, that plan is so important. And and certainly the military right now is really trying to retain, right? Individuals are trying to keep the, keep the talent. Uh, mm -hmm. So to your point is you need to own your transition if you are in fact going to transition out. Bill, how do people find your book and how do they get in touch with you? Thank you for that. Baghdadi's on Amazon. It's at Barnes and Noble. It's available through IndieBound. It's at most bookstores and in many libraries. And if for some reason the bookseller that you like to deal with doesn't have it, just ask and they can get you or order a copy. Um, you can also order it through my website at BillRileyAuthor.com. That's Bill Riley, Romeo, India, Lima, Echo, Yankee, Author.com. And um, anywhere on social media at Bill Riley Author. And just, um, Hit me up. My my next big event is at the Boise Idaho Barnes and Noble at fourteen hundred hours on nineteen May. And if you're in Boise, come on out. I'd, I'd love to meet you. That's uh, so great. Well, audience, I, listeners, I got to tell you that uh, you heard a little bit about Bill's story. There's so much more behind Bill and what he's doing. His book, Bag Daddy: How Saddam Hussein Taught Me to Be a Better Father. Uh, is a great read, compelling read. If you're in the Boise area, be sure you hook him up or look him up uh, and hook him up with other opportunities too because he's got so much to give. So, Bill, thank you for being on the show. Thanks, Mike. I really enjoyed talking with you. Thanks for having me. You bet.